So, as you can see, the disease has well and truly taken hold. I don't have very long left. And this is the point in proceedings where I should make the shocking deathbed confession. You know the thing, right at the end of the story, this is where I tell you that one hidden thing that makes you completely reevaluate everything you ever knew or everything you ever felt about me. Except, you know, fuck that. There is something I feel I ought to tell you, but I'm not just going to give it away. You know, I've always been a capricious bastard. Um, why should I start being charitable now? So here's the deal. One of the statements on this tape is the truth. The absolute, unvarnished, ugly truth. Everything else is a bare-faced lie. I've hidden the thing you need to know in amongst a fat chunk of random noise and it's up to you to filter that noise out. If you know me, as you so often claim that you do, this should be simple. If not, well then you can have the same problem you always have with my little games, aren't you? There's a key tucked away somewhere in the house to a safety deposit box. In that box are £25,000 and a brown leather wallet. If you look inside you'll see by the credit cards and the driving licence that the wallet isn't mine and neither is the money. I took the case from a dead man. He was lying in an alleyway in Chinatown. I'd been taking a shortcut home after a long late shift and I sort of tripped over him in the dark. I don't know how long he'd been dead when I found him. Um, he was cold though and his fingers were stiff as I pried them free from the case. I don't know why I took it. I don't know, just figured the dead guy didn't need it anymore. I had no way of knowing what was in the case until I got it home and pried it open. Which is probably why I took the wallet as well. I was terrible at art when I was a kid, but I was really keen to learn. I asked my art teacher about classes and he said, rather than my mum and dad paying for lessons, he'd be happy to tutor me for free, after hours. Lovely. So for a few weeks, um, that's what we did, things went really well. My life drawing came on in leaps and bounds and the teacher even posed for a couple of pencil drawings that promptly got hung up in the front room and crowed over. Crowed over by a delighted mum and dad. Then the teacher asked if I would pose for him. He said that an artist needs to understand what goes on from both both sides of the canvas. To model was a way for an artist to achieve an empathetic relationship with his subject. I agreed, of course. That made perfect sense to me. Quite happily stripped for him. As he looked at me, as he reached out for me, I felt I was on the verge of understanding a whole new way of seeing. Even when his cock was halfway down my throat, I felt somehow transcendent. We were never discovered. After a while he told me he had nothing more to teach and the classes kind of petered out. He left school soon after. Apparently I wasn't the only boy receiving extracurricular instruction. Do I ever think about him? Yeah, sure, sometimes. Have I ever replicated the works that we created on the art room floor? No. Do I ever consider it? I met Svetlana when I was on the six-month contract on the south coast a few years ago. 
she was Croatian and she needed a British passport. I wanted her from the moment that we met. She was gorgeous. So, two weeks later, imagine how I felt when she asked her to marry me. She offered to pay. I would have paid her. It was a simple ceremony. Me, my bride, the Indian couple who ran the paper shop across the road as witnesses. There was a pub just down the road and Svetlana and I went in for a few drinks to celebrate our newly completed business arrangement. We had more than a few, more than a few, and I ended up telling Svetlana a little bit more about the way I felt than I should. And just like that, she decided that a marriage wasn't a marriage unless it was consummated. I'll never know if that gesture was simply a kindness to the poor little drunken English boy who was cross-eyed with lust, or whether the night we spent in the upstairs room in the pub actually meant anything at all to her. Anyway, the next morning she was gone. I thought no more about it, to the point where I kind of forgot about it when I married my present one and only. you think some of the fish would pick up on it really, wouldn't you? Oh, and there's a postscript. I started getting postcards a few years ago. No return address, Bristol postmarks. One a year. Each one has a picture of a little boy on it. Each year is bigger, and his smile to the camera is bolder. His face has the same heart shape as Svetlana's. He's got my eyes. She was my first girlfriend. She was 19, cautious, a little bit shy. I was 18, desperate, hungry. Our weekend sessions on their parents' sofa were like combat. Advance, retreat, attack, repel. We both hated what we were doing to each other. But we were both crazy in love with each other as well. And I still can't tell you if that made it worse or not, because I did what I did out of love out of the feeling that she'd thank me once I released her from the cycle that we were in. I raped her. Her parents were away, we had the place to ourselves. We were on the sofa as always, she tried to push me away and I just kept on coming. I wish I could say some kind of red mist came down, that somehow I didn't quite know what I was doing. I saw everything with perfect clarity. I still do. Even now, I can close my eyes, I can see myself holding her down, I can see the soccer forced in her mouth to keep her quiet. She phoned me every day for six months after that. She was convinced it was her fault. She thought if we talked it all through, then maybe we could come to an understanding about why I'd forced myself on her in that unseemly manner, that's the way she put it. I tried for a little while at least to see things from her perspective. I even tried blaming her for what happened. But finally I told her there was nothing more to say. And that the blame was mine. I raped her. And I raped her for no other reason than because I could. She stopped calling after that. 